we have something in common. We're both PKs, which means preacher's kid. So that is, um, I think, can be a curse and a blessing. <laughs> so, but without further ado, I am so grateful that Jessica is here tonight and um, that God used you in this strong manner. Thank you. Dear God, this is for your glory. It's not by my might, it's not by the, my power. This is by the spirit of the living God. That you who begun a good work in all of us who are faithful to bring it to completion. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. My name is Jessica Joy on Facebook. Yay, <laughs> Jessica Joy. It's not because I'm a dillbilly. It's just my friend said you might want to leave your last name off. <laughs> just for Google's sake. So Jessica Joy, until God gives me another last name, I'm, I am a little hillbilly in the fact that I now love to go mudding. <laughs> yes, found out what that is. It's so much more fun when it rains. <laughs> and um, I, I'm country. So, um, so uh, yes, Jessica Joy, and um, I currently enjoy recovery over legalism. Yes. <laughs> comes with being a preacher's kid, because we think this is all monkey performance and this is do monkey do, dance monkey dance, and uh -huh. the other preacher's kids up in here, this, this is not a performance, and it takes a lifetime to get delivered from that, so um, I enjoy recovery from, um, I re enjoy recovery from legalism, I am definitely a Paul Saul, she was looking at human trafficking charges four years ago, and here she is now, boom. So I'm uh, still rough around the edges, and um, like I get like one or two cuss words come out one, one or two times. I don't know how often, but anywho, that's my disclaimer. God is an awesome God. Um, I also enjoy recovery from sexual um, based trauma as a child. I enjoy recovery over uh, man, man, the list goes on. But I currently, I would say. I am currently enduring um, the holidays without a family. This is the family the porn built. This is my forever family. So I'm currently suffering from too many Hallmark shows this last week. I was like, you guys don't need to watch this because I'm here. And I had this, uh, I had this constant reminder I'm single. <laughs> Right? Um, but I also, I, I need to enjoy the fact that the singleness is a gift. Yes. If 40% of the United States is living in this, it's called a gift. And to run like a maniac with it. So um, that's, I enjoy the gift of singleness. What else? Okay, so <laughs> we'll, we'll get going from there that um, I am so glad that you came to celebrate recovery tonight. I know it's a few of you, it's your first time to a meeting like this. I said, okay, it's kind of like AA with some God tossed in. So higher power is not like um, a sheep out back or my uh, kale chips coming out of the oven. Like, obviously, I don't have any city girl allergies. I enjoy my carbohydrates. Oh, my. There goes my phone. Who is it back up? Oh, um, you'll, you'll, you'll take a second. What? Okay, just a minute. Man. Somebody want to hold this steady? Okay, everybody, that was my stand that's held together with tape. Yes, <laughs> tape, packaging tape. That's my... Uh, um, what? Um, let's go back to 1981. Let's go back to nine months before July 21st, 1981. I was, the sanctity and the value of my life started nine months before July 21st, right? right. That I was set apart nine months before I made my debut. That I was never meant to be a burden on society. I was never to, meant to be a weight on my family. I was never meant to weigh down my, uh, the United States. Oh, the social class they call the sex worker. I was never destined for that, but I was destined for such a time as this. Esther 4.12, for such a time as this. 
every single one of you, the DNA that God wove into you, your moment, your moment is now. So in 1981, I was born five foot three, just kidding. I was actually <laughs> five foot eight by third grade. So like I did not fit in on the the playground, all the kids are running up to me like I'm the teacher. I'm like, yo, I'm one of you. Like we are playing <laughs> Rainbow Bright and Barbie and the Rockers and the Couch Patch Kids. I'm one of you. So um so like everybody assumes when you're born tall that you're a natural athlete. Well absolutely not. That was not in my natural DNA. My fingers do not talk to my head, my hands do not like there's no coordination on like this. I, you know, it's, oh, you're tall, you must be great at sports. Absolutely not. So where did I find my value? First, what I thought I brought to the table was through the deacon's daughter. Her grandfather was molesting her and she was molesting me. So what did I think that I brought to the table? We had the song earlier during worship that says that I'll bring my brokenness. Mm -hmm. But what I thought I brought to the table was my, my body was my value. See, she was the popular girl at school, so I was popular by association, and I was the one invited to stay the night. Nobody else was. And so I thought, like, this is what I have to bring to the table, mm -hmm. is my body. The song earlier tonight said, what I bring is my brokenness. Keep that in mind. The next thing that I thought that I brought to the table since I flunked sports is I thought I brought to the table, I, I started to spin off of the American Cancer Society. So I thought that being good and being an activist and changing the world, like I was the idiot in school that was like, putting up posters, stand for something or fall for anything. Like, that was me. I was like, Judy, we're going to start, like, spin off of the American Cancer Society, and here's the pig's lung, and I'm going <laughs> to freak out all these little kids. And I love to be loved, and I love to be hated, because that's how my father lived. Those were his fans, and those, that's how he, I was like, look, those people love my dad. And that is what I thought I brought to the table. Well, I'm just going to be another version of my father, and people are going to love me, and that's what I bring to the table, my works, my works, my works. So when I went off to be a youth full-time youth pastor at the age of 19, what did I bring to the table? Purity. So I was huge into the True Love Waits movement. How many of you remember back in the 90s it was cool yeah. to save yourself for marriage? Yeah. I don't know, maybe that was a big thing back in the 30s or the in 20s. The South. It's just like, I know that, that we're kind of going back to like, wait a minute, that was a women's <laughs> liberation we just had with Hugh Hefner. Maybe we were not liberated through that sexual movement. But I was part of what I thought was sexual liberation. We'll get to that in a second. So. When I graduated from high school, I went full-time into ministry. I was huge into miracles, signs, and wonders. I was huge into, like, my parents didn't raise me super Pentecostal, but man, I put that cape on real well because I loved rules. I loved do more, do more, do more, pray more, fast more, do more. God, was, God is the God of the do more. I was seeking the hand of God and not the heart of God, and I will stand here today and say I never knew a relationship with Jesus Christ. I never knew God. No. Until these last four years, I would pray for grace and mercy and the joy of my salvation, but I had no idea what it is to experience true grace and mercy. So what I brought to the table was my legalism and my rules and my way, and this is what I thought God was. Do you understand? Oh, yeah. God is loved to not register with me. I was a youth pastor, and I said, if you wear a spaghetti strap to you, Kim, I will embarrass you. I was all about rules, skirts this long, everything has to be whatever. And so when I was 23 years old, I'm going out to my car in Estes Park, Colorado to warm it up. It happens to be on Easter Sunday. What's that week? I'm supposed to speak at the YMCA of the Rockies on Wednesday about purity to the missionettes. Because I was pure, 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 pure. Well, I'm going out to my car on Easter Sunday, and I'm here crunching in the snow, but I, in Colorado, there's snow on the ground, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you understand snow is on the ground in April, but I was going out to my car, and all I remember is my head hitting my car, and I see my blood, like, Kill Bill, like, blood everywhere, all over the snow, and all I'm thinking as I'm going down on this asphalt is, was my, I'm not wearing a skirt. I'm not, I'm not skinny. 
I'm not wearing high heels. I didn't flirt with anybody. And I'm going down a checklist of what the rape girl goes through. Like, the rape girl deserves this. And I was like, but God, I'm your favorite Christian. I was at a church plant, and I was like, I'm starving for God. I'm, like, taking a bottle of palm olive to wash my hair, my clothes, my dishes. And I'm like, this is what the best Christian deserves. That word deserves is what it has Choke the life out of the United States is that I'm entitled. Yep, it's right. And as a Christian, I felt entitled to the soft path in life, right? I, oh, I didn't sign up for this. So what did I bring my trauma? In 2003, we didn't know much about PTSD. We knew it was called shell shock. The guys come back from a desert storm. We find a call to PTSD and... Maybe we might want to help these guys out whenever they get here, but we don't know what we're helping them out with. And we never associated sexually based trauma to PTSD, right? Yeah. Nobody, it was not something you talk about, especially if you're in ministry. Like, what did you do, Jessica, to deserve that rape? Yeah. It's, it must be your fault that you got raped. I had taken that stage on Wednesday and I started peeing. As I stood, I just peed there and my hair was falling out in clumps. And I, this is before we had YouTube and makeup tutorials. I didn't know how to glue my face back together. And this was the best I had to bring. Is I brought a trauma that I didn't understand that God took care of 2,000 years ago. And I lived in my trauma over and over and over and over. My fight, flight, or freeze. Everybody's the enemy. Everybody's out to get me. Everybody's out to get me and, and badger me back with legalism and badger me this. And so you know what? I, I spun out, well, I'm going to have sex with everybody. I'm going to call the shots. I'm going to pull up my pants and I'm going to walk away from the scene of the crime. And then I realized, guys, enjoy that. I was trying to rape men. And then I found out you can get paid for this. So, um, I lost a ton of weight right away. I went into, um, I picked up a magazine as you leave a, a restaurant. I called up this escort ad, and I definitely thought I'm not pretty enough to be an escort. I started off with a fetish service, and then I picked up doing, um, went to a party. Somebody said, do you want to run my porn site? This was way long ago when people paid for pornography. And I was like, yes. And once again, that was what I brought to the table. Here's my fans again. And I saw the back room of the porn site. What was the busiest day of the week? Sunday. Sunday, absolutely. Where were most of the buyers? From the Bible Belt. Oh yeah. And I was like, here's my church. Here's my church. My first journal entry as I went into um, escorting was what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his very soul? Yep. You see, I had, those, I had the spray tan, I had the, the hair, the nails, I had paid off my debt, got a new car, and I was like, I make more than women lawyers, I make more than everybody. But I had nothing. I had nothing. The only difference between rape and that prostituted moment was the money on the counter. How did I get through that? And later would go on to coach young ladies stare at the bridge of their nose, or they'll suck the life out of you. They'll suck the life out of you. I never understood alcoholism, but you know what? I need a buffer to make it through the day. There's no way that whenever you involve money in this, that it's called consent, paid rape. That's exactly what it is. And guess what? The body keeps score. The body keeps score. Oh, that stripper's crazy. The body is keeping score for her. Oh, poor girls are crazy. The body is keeping score for her. There is no man, if you put the shoe on the other foot, no man can endure 10 guys taking them on a day. Oh, well, well, no, well, no, they're not all ugly. Maybe that one good looking one. And you're thinking, but do you know what? Let me tell you, after a day or two or three or three, you forget that even one is good looking. My soul was gone. In 2008, <clears throat> my, um, this. Then down in Florida, our agents would fly us down to Florida. It's all human trafficking. We call them suitcase pimps. 
We call them suitcase pimps. That is human trafficking. It's the Romeo trafficker, if you study human trafficker, human trafficking. So I'd fly down to Florida and I would see this is a different kind of pornography. It's called reality pornography. But all I'm seeing is rows of girls and we're all waiting for, in the chairs and we're waiting to get our makeup done. And the makeup artist looks out the door and she's looking to see which girl's done crying. Because at that time, the stock market had crashed in 2008, 2009. The girls were being driven by who? Their parents. Their parents were sitting in the parking lot. If you watch the documentary, Nefarious, we are no different than third world countries. We have put lipstick on a pig, and it's called human slavery. If you study slavery, if you study abolition of the turn of the century, you will see you will see the same differences between the field slave and the house slave. They're like, why would we want to be set free from this? Who's going to take us in? But they call it the mud sledge, that that's the best this girl will do. They're legalizing prostitution in 13 states right now because they do not believe the trannies can get a job, the gay, the, the gay community can get a job, and that women of color can get a job, so they think that that's the best that they can do. If you look to me in the eyes, Man and woman, if you looked me in the eyes and if you would have told me this was the best that I could do, I would break right then. I had to hold on to one thing, hope. I hated God, but I knew that there must be something. <sighs> Many hotel rooms, I'd sit on the floor, I'd sit in the bathroom between clients and I would see my deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. I'm seeing the songs of my youth. I'm seeing a hold to Jesus. I surrender. Trust me, I did not want to be there. But this is what society said made me worthy. This is what I thought I brought to the table. Was my body. And sexually based trauma is the root of every single girl running to the wrong foot of the wrong altar, altering themselves, all, uh, showing, shoving themselves up on the altar of exploitation and calling it women's liberation. You will not find liberation at the base of human trauma. Our trauma was paid for. Man, woman, your trauma has been paid for. Why I'm in legislation now is I didn't realize that the nation had a story to go right back at you, sister. I didn't realize my nation was being destroyed by pornography and there's trauma in your homes. I didn't realize you, the nation was as broken as I was. See, Hollywood has no idea that's sucking the life out of this country. Ugh. They have no idea. I didn't know I was going to. I thought when I graduated from my recovery program, like I was skipping in daisies, I had no idea that pornography had destroyed my nation. Ah, I didn't even know a combat for my nation, and I had complex PTSD. Ah. So what I brought to the table was my trauma. And then when I was 30, and I'd seen HIV cover-ups, and I heard that I was old. I didn't know I was old. I went to Hollywood at 27, and I didn't know that was old. Then I went back to, I went back, my boyfriend comes out as bisexual, and I'm like, I'm okay with that. My best friend commits suicide. I find out on Twitter, and I was the last friend she had who had her dragged out with security, dragging her out, and she was crying, and her agents are calling me, and I'm like, sorry, I don't have her money. <laughs> It's human trafficking. I wasn't crying because she's dead. I was crying because I never money. <laughs> Do you see how warped? So in 2011, I'm trying to keep condoms out of porn. That was my first and last hearing, but that was a hearing that I saw the pornography industry lose. I saw hundreds of people feeling a hearing, which one day I will see again, hopefully on December 4th in New Jersey. And I came into that room and it was just me and one other porn girl and I looked at her and I was like, dude, we're going to lose today. And we certainly did. The porn industry does not even know we're coming. I check. I'm like, porn news? Nope, still don't know we're here. Cool. We're going to be sly, yo. We are going to move in five pornography resolutions in five months with not knowing how to do this. I learned off of YouTube. And I'm not kidding. 
So I go back to Colorado to be normal. I have my car shipped to Colorado. All I know is that I'm watching the Lifetime channel while the rest of the world is watching porn. I tell, I, I'm like, I'm rocking in the Burbank airport with my taxes, because I didn't want to go to prison, so I'm like, trash bags of tax receipts, and I'm crying, and I'm rocking it, and for the first time, I don't care what I look like, and I'm rocking, and I'm just saying, I want to be normal, I want to be normal. I go back to Colorado, and I say, here's three months rent. I'm going to get married in three months, because I had no idea what reality was. I said it works on TV. I honestly, you know how guys think porn is like real. I thought the Lifetime channel was reality. It's called female porn in some circles. So, when I could not, no longer, here's my rate. The world just told me that my rate was $1,600 an hour, so I thought this was my value. But when you get old, they're like, no, no, no. On the sex buyer forums, you're like, their value is 400, their value is 300, she's old now. So I want to keep my pride. My best friend's pimping out girls, so I start doing it too. I'm going on Match.com dates, and I'm pimping out girls. I'm trying to find a husband, once again, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. <sighs> my mind was sick. I go on social media, I become the Denver Tech Center social media madam. I got figured out, I got these things. Yeah, I say I got this figured out, and then my little handheld phone over there went whoosh with the duct tape. But I go on to social media. This is before it was in style. People are like, oh my gosh, people are in social media. Yeah, because I was going to strip clubs, and a predator needs a they need a stronger personality than the girl that they're preying on. And I simply used what I saw in Hollywood. I was like, okay, okay, we had photo shoots every single week, we made a fun sorority, and I was thinking, all of this is kind of legal, right? Um, and we just keep the cycle going. On the first day, I'm like, I get this big thing of alcohol, and I think it's cute, and then the girls start slamming it, and I'm like, dude, it's only nine in the morning, and they're like, how do you think we can do this sober? I said, stare at their nose. Last thing I need is y'all drunk and at 10 a.m. falling off the beds. Do you know the busiest time of the year? Right now. Quadriplegic, people in wheelchairs would come. Every single week, the girls would cry because they, see, they saw one oppression lead to another oppression. How do we have sex with guys in the wheelchair? And it was just like, and this guy, he's a, he's a firefighter. He can't afford this. And he's a school teacher. He can't afford this. And do you know what I trained I saw in eight years? I saw my clients went from older men to high schoolers. We had 18, 19 year old boys from high schools coming into the brothel. Do you guys listening to this? The guys would tell their friends. And before you know, we had Denver Broncos. We had the Denver Nuggets. Those are the oppressors. Come on now. Don't talk to me about oppression when you are the biggest sex buyers. And it was high school students. See, the rewiring of the brain that you see on truth about porn.org is the rewiring of the brain is happening so fast, not like the 1990s, that it's going like that they like boom. I have to act it out on somebody, and they find it online. It's on all the dating apps, everywhere you look, Tinder, Plenty of Fish. Um, you don't even have to go look for the sex buyer ads and pages. It's all over, and it's easy. <sighs> sex is easy and no longer sacred. I've never had sex inside a committed relationship, so I honestly don't know what sex is. So in 2013, October 5th, 2013, I go to take down this Heidi, I'm working with the Vice to take down other girls, long story short, and I go into Vice, and there, the office fills up with detectives in Denver, and they said, we are not looking at anybody but you, and the file on the desk was my file. I left paper trails, I was all over the place, I was bringing, I tell girls you're gonna make 30,000 your first month, and then I gotta take you on the road to the I-70 corridor, I'm taking girls to the Country Club Plaza, I'm taking them down to Wichita, the Country Club Plaza, on to Illinois, go back, go, I am not even thinking that I'm the bad person here. I'm looking over my shoulder like human trafficking, like my parents are sending me books in the mail on human trafficking, and I'm like, because <laughs> mine had lipstick and fur coats but I've destroyed those women equally. Where are they now? They are still 
stuck in the addiction of fame, glamour, beauty, all the things of this world. And I say, take it all and give me Jesus. So after going to altar call after altar call, I'm not getting out of the sex industry. In 2013, there's hardly any beds in the United States. There's a whole bunch of awareness. And I'm yelling at the ones who come to the porn conventions. I said, you better give me more than a t-shirt. What happens if one of us wants to get out? Oh, well, we'll take you to Home Depot. They're hiring. What? My rent's this much and this much? I did not know how to not spend $5,000 a day. Cool thing about recovery is it's called Dave Ramsey. It's free for programs. <laughs> but God got a hold of me. And I want to tell you the last time that I came to the table of God was like the worship song you would just open this service with. I came to Kentucky. And I drove to Kentucky and I told him, I know that you have a two and a half month wait. I said, I'll sleep on the floor. You're going to have to tell me no to my face. I didn't realize what 1,200 square feet looks like with nine-year-olds. <laughs> but when I walked in there, I had my wigs, I had my tan, I had my, like, I, I had my wigs and my tan. I remember getting my nails clipped off and I was crying with the old Chinese lady. She's like, you want the look of that? I'm like, oh, no. I'm crying as my nails are going. I get my hair chopped off all one length. If you follow me on Facebook, you'll see that it was missing in huge clumps anyway. And I go to recovery. And they, they say, we go through, we're going through your suitcase. And they take my metallic bikinis, because I guess I thought I was going to a day spa. And they take my wigs, and they take my tan. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm crying, because I said, if you take that from me, there's going to be nobody to love me. Like, let that hit you. I didn't think anybody would love me. So I'm sitting at the table, and I'm going to say that this is the most important part of your story. Is I sat at the table with absolutely no human possessions. All I had was sweatpants, fuzzy socks, and a hoodie. And this woman puts her hand on my shoulder, and I start crying because I'm like, I have nothing to give you. And see, that's awesome about God, is he wants us to come to a table, the prodigal's chair, where I'm like, God, I have nothing to give you. Like, what I have is in that Miata that got the roof slashed out of it um, weeks before I went on the road. I'm like, and then I had to give up more hoodies. That was funny. Like, my last bag of hoodies, like, we're just talking about the 54 days ago. And I, like, I like that my hoodies would fit my car. And I was like, you can only take a hoodie with you. So, like, I fit to the place of God, and that's like a place that I have to go every single day. One cool thing about the 12 steps is you can always go back. You can always go back to the steps. You see, the most coolest part of being in Kentucky and being a preacher's kid is me calling my parents and I said, Mom and Dad, nobody got saved today. I didn't walk anybody across the road. And I said, do you know what? God loves me and I'm doing nothing but healing. Do you see that God loves you when you are healing and you're in your season of healing? Like my value is no greater past your resolutions as it was sitting on that court field wondering if God forgot about me. God didn't forget about you. There's seasons coming, and I'm saying embrace it. What I struggle with the most when you're like, what am I currently struggling with? It's knowing the battle belongs to the Lord. Like the people I work with, they tell me to be nice like every day. <laughs> Because I, I feel like it's all on my shoulders. And I have to remind myself, it's not by might, and it's not by my power, but it's by the spirit of the living God that these things will be accomplished. There's a divine appointment on all of your lives. You see, I left my program at six months to go save the world, and they said I was too soon out of the cooker. And I was like, what? And they, I, I asked the Atlanta Dream Center, what do you recommend to go back to your program? They said, you can start over. And I said, God, you know, I'm 31. I have, my eggs are committing suicide every month. I need to get married. I need to have, I need, a, and I need, I need, I need. And God can't, I'm like too old. I gotta start life. And do you know what? I want to look at every single one of you 
you, I'm guessing a couple of you are over your 20s, okay. that your greatest days are in front of you. And I know a lot of you might feel like me when I was sitting on the cornfield watching airplanes go by that I used to fly first class on. And I go, God, did you forget about me? I'm delivering pizza going, God, they didn't think I was worth a dollar. As God is stripping you of everything that you think you bring to the table, and he'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you say, all I have is me to bring to the table. Can I get an amen? amen. I have no idea if I have any makeup left on, but I hear definitely I've seen a raw version. But I just, I wanted to leave you that tonight. I want you to follow me on Facebook, Jessica Joy. I have Square, if you want to make any donations, I never have charged a speaking fee, and God has always taken care of me. I got brand new tires in Cincinnati, like everything that I've needed, God's taking care of me. And so if you want to follow me and be Giving Tuesday to tomorrow, nonprofit, whatever, like please, there's no great, everything that you spend at the strip club, <clears throat> I'm right here. <laughs> God's like, Psh. Take care of this one. I'm only taking care of my Facebook. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate and I covet your prayers. As I said, I'll be speaking again tomorrow um, in Richmond. Just follow me. We'll all know where I am tomorrow. Trust me, I never know. And um, I'll be at the Capitol the next two days. Um, I learned from from YouTube, from the pro-gay and pro-abortion. I, I used to like sit in on their classes and watch how they pass bills through, like flying. Sh -sh -sh. So um, I will be following those who have passed pornography laws here in your state. If you want to lobby with me, dude, you don't even have to say anything. But um, you'll follow me on Facebook. Jan December 4th is our biggest hearing in New Jersey with 49 sponsors to pass filtration sold on all technology. Can I get an amen? So when I'm at the Capitol tomorrow, what am I doing? What is Jessica doing? That's her end goal, is that a seatbelt is not an upgrade. I was part of the porn industry when we laughed and said, click here if you're over age 18. I was the, one of the first to laugh. thought that was hilarious. Yes, absolutely. And the porn industry is being held accountable for destroying lives. The state of Utah has already opened the doors to where children can file suits on porn companies. Amen. Oh my goodness, Daniels. I can't wait to see some major class action lawsuits for some, using the same scenarios, hopefully, as um, Big Tobacco. But this is, we are on the right side of history. I have to tell myself that every day, because it looks like doors are slamming in my face. But I am on the right side of history. And I want to say thank you guys for your prayers and your support, that everything that was done in secret will be shot from the rooftops. And I can't wait to see all of you testify at the hearing that we're going to have in this state to close down pornography on technology. That you have to opt into it instead of be assaulted to it. So thank you so much for your time. I know that you guys are going to have small groups, maybe. And so that you guys can... I'm one of those people that love to put hot towels and, like, poke out all the blackheads. That's what Celebrate Recovery is, where you put the hot towel of God's conviction on, and he, do you know what? He's gentle. And he's like, let's move that out. I am like a glut. I love living with counselors, and I'm like, Ooh, what can we go counseling today? I love... I'm like a counseling junkie now. So, um... <laughs> Anyways, I don't know if I can say that, but I love counseling. I'm like Dr. Phil and steroids. Give it to me. So um, embrace the healing that there is so much there's so much awesomeness on the other side of your healing. Thank you so much.